Shortly before her demise, in the summer of 2001, R&B singer Aaliyah would embark on an international promo tour, making several radio and magazine appearances in preparation for her upcoming third album. Among these appearances was an interview with a popular German magazine called Die Zeit, in which she revealed a reoccurring dream that she had began having more frequently, which was translated as her saying, it is dark in my favorite dream. Someone followed me. Why? I do not know. I'm afraid. Then suddenly I lift off. I fly far away. How do I feel myself? As if sponges in the air, free, weightless. No one can reach me. No one can touch me. A wonderful feeling. Still, that dream worries me a little. What does he want to tell me? That I would escape from the pressures of success? This article would be published on the day of Aliyah's funeral. But just what had been chasing her? Could the answer be found in the music? Throughout the summer of 2001, there were many eerie circumstances that when translated alluded to an unfortunate demise. During her promo tour, she stopped in France to interview with Skyrock Radio. And in the queue of songs that the radio station had played alongside Aliyah's music were French songs. One in particular that I will not attempt to try to pronounce had lyrics that read, Thus ends our story because our love in fact burned his last hours of glory. Now they fly away with you. Seven years of my past, of my soul and my memory. There is too little time to live here, to play out this tragedy. As many of you know, Aliyah's career spanned seven years. Another song that played was the debut single by a new French artist named Wallen, who said that Aliyah had been her main inspiration. This song addressed the death of her father, singing, His return to the country went well in August, but his journey was cold in a hold. Nothing will bring him back to me. Basically meaning his body was flown back to his home country in August and in a bag, which would be the same fate that befell Aliyah and eight others that August weekend. But at the time, with Aliyah speaking only English, all she's hearing is bass thumping French rhyming lyrics that don't make any sense. But hey, that track banging, so it's all good. Until you look at some of the messages in the music. Aliyah herself had warned about the effects and dangers of cocaine usage in her song, Erica Kane, singing, She's back on the streets, a fee for the night. Fill you with grief, she cuts like a knife. I really don't think you should mess around, cause all that she can do is bring you down, and there's nothing for you to gain. And it was a cautionary tale, up until pilot Luis Morales, who had been busted with cocaine before, had many traces of coke in his system when he flew her plane into the ground, inadvertently. But were these just mere coincidences? Or could the answers to what had been following her lie in movies and media as well? Death was a common occurrence in her films. Her first film was called Romeo Must Die, and she starred opposite a man named Jet. Death had followed everyone in that film. You to stay away from her. Why, Daddy? Huh? Afraid I'll catch one of your bullets? It is too dangerous right now, girl. I'll take my chances. We've also spoken on her last completed film, Queen of the Damned, and how her character's death foretold many things in real life, down to how the bodies looked when they were discovered. I think everyone has a bit of a fascination with the dark side, and um, it's fun to go to the movies and escape and, and really get deep into the whole fantastical characters. And um, I myself have always loved the dark side as well. So I think it's something that everyone secretly longs for and wants. She had also filmed a few scenes for the Matrix movie series and tried to get in films that spoke out against the wicked industry. Could Aaliyah have seen through the veil and been subliminally trying to break free of the Matrix, so to speak? Her TV specials that premiered that summer showed her preparation for her new album. One of the specials shows clips of the Twin Towers. The other special shows Aaliyah and her stylist Eric Foreman screaming erratically as they were being tossed into the air on a roller coaster ride, which many viewers felt uncomfortable seeing as this would take place just one month before the pair were literally falling out of the sky for a different reason entirely. Many have voiced that this gave them a visual as to what it may have been like in those last moments. Even many YouTubers have pointed out that in some of Aaliyah's interviews, she was constantly interrupted by the sounds of airplanes nearby. Hmm, nothing but fun. I'd probably rent, um, God, what was the name of that? Oh, airplane. Good, give me a second to fix this. Yeah, go ahead, that's okay. Yeah. Is it exactly where you thought it would be at this time of your life? Um, another plane. You can think on that one. 
Could the answer be found in other synchronicities, like numbers? Aaliyah was 22 at the time of her demise. Her film Queen of the Damned would be released on 2-22, 2002. And when you look at the boat that was to transport Aaliyah and her crew back to the airport to fly the plane. Hold up. Wait a minute. It's a 22. I mean, hell, even without traffic, Aaliyah's apartment in Central Park West was just 22 minutes from the Twin Towers, which were destroyed by airplanes just two weeks after her death. I mean, even down to the labels, how at one point she was signed to Atlantic Records, and how it was Atlantic Flight Group who handled the transportation of cargo for her last video shoot. How, at the time, her parent company, Virgin Records, and Virgin Airlines are part of the same conglomerate. But somehow, Virgin couldn't square away Aaliyah and the others with a decent enough flight. Instead, Black Round Associates would enlist Black Hawk, a shady company not licensed to fly to the Bahamas to pick up their biggest artist and primary asset. Don't get me started, y'all. Let me get started. But one thing that we know for sure is that people close to Aaliyah said that she had a fear of small planes. And she always had a very serious fear of planes in general. Mm -hmm. So she had to overcome a fear to get on that plane on the way there. She really didn't want to get, when she get, saw the, the little plane, you know, she really wasn't too comfortable with that, you know. She didn't really like the plane that we were going on over there. She was like, I hate this one. You know what I mean? It's so small. I was like, don't, you know, I was like, don't worry. I know she was nervous. She even told my mom, I, I, she called my mom and said, I have to get on this little plane. And my mom was like, oh, you know, maybe you, you shouldn't. Why then would she allegedly be demanding that excess luggage fly on an overloaded aircraft? And I, I, I couldn't grasp it. I couldn't put my, put, 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 put my psyche around anything like that happening. It just didn't make any sense. Aliyah's mother, Diane, wanted answers. But throughout the investigation, kept coming up with more questions as we all did. In the song, Can You Hear Me, Missy Elliott sings that Diane was crying out, wondering why her daughter had to go the way she went, and could the spirit of Aaliyah provide any real answers? So in February of 2003, Diane would sit down with John Edward for a psychic reading, and the transcripts from that reading are pretty lengthy, but I'll cover the basics. John, okay, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that I have a male who's coming through claiming to be above you and he is making it like he's either your father or your stepfather but he's an older male he's making me feel that i need to acknowledge the letter w like he's connected to the letter w i also have somebody younger who's passed i feel like somebody lost their child and the older man is letting me know that the child is here but with this child this isn't a healthcare passing this is something that happened so it's got to be an event or something that actually takes place that caused that person to pass. To me, it feels impact related. So I feel like somebody passes with an impact, with a gunshot. There's a bang that takes place. It's not a suicide. This is somebody claiming responsibility. Well, it's not that they're claiming responsibility. They're kind of claiming responsibility. They're making me feel like they put themselves in the wrong position, the wrong place at the wrong time. And that this event was extremely publicized. And headlines and spotlights all around it and they're showing me that there are three or four people who are reporting something that seems to be slightly off like something was being reported and things were being left out of the report and the way it was being reported made this individual look bad and i feel as though i need to bring this up some way i don't know it's like this weird i don't want to call it controversy but there's some controversial issue that comes up with this okay now i'm going to go back and say that this male who's coming through again is claiming to be above you that means the father, the uncle, the grandfather. He wants me to know that this younger male is coming through with him. I'm calling it a male energy because there's a very dominant energy attached to this. It may be female, but if this is a girl who's passed, I'm getting a very dominant energy. I have to let you know that he comes through with this child. But in particular, I know that you lost a child. You understand that? Is that true? Diane. Yes. John. Now there's an A name connection that comes up here. They want me to acknowledge the A, okay? And they're making me feel like I also need to acknowledge the other son, the brother. They tell me to acknowledge the boy who's here. They're showing me your son, living. And then you have a daughter that has passed, right? Diane, yes. John, okay, here's the deal. She has a very dominant energy. The way it comes across, I would think you lost a son. Because this energy is very masculine, very strong and tough. But her toughness is not an exterior. 
It's not an external toughness. It's an internal spiritual kind of toughness. And she wants her brother to know that she came through. Her major concern is you. She's making me feel like you two were more like sisters or buddies. She wants me to tell you to talk about going to the church, going to the priest, going to the place. And you were there by yourself. I'm feeling a very spiritual feeling place. Whether it be a church, a temple, I don't know. I'm in this place, and while I'm here, I feel like nobody is physically there with you. It's your quiet time. It's your place to be there. And she's making me feel like she was there with you. I don't know if you're coming up on the second month of her passing or on the second anniversary of her passing, but I feel like we're coming up on two. And she's making me feel like I need to talk to you about selling your property or you selling the house or selling the stuff that's coming up. And she sees this, okay? She doesn't talk about her father, though. The father is not around? Diane. He is. He's around. John. He's living? Diane. Yes. John. Where does the L come in for him? Like Lynn or Leo or Lee or Leah? Diane. That's her name. John. She wants me to acknowledge the Lynn, Lee, or Leo kind of version. I feel like I want to take that and call her that. Or Dad maybe called her that. Diane. He call her Lily most of the time. John, she's telling me to tell you what you wrote was published, and she's acknowledging that. And she wants to know about the yellow tattoo or yellow painting that comes up here that she wants me to bring up, okay? She knows that. I'm back to the fact that her passing was an event. There is an accident, but she's not driving this. This is not something that she was responsible for. But I feel like I don't have to be here. Like I don't have to be in the vehicle. Like I didn't have to be here. Diane, mm-hmm, John, but it's the right time because she was done with what she had to do here, as hard as that might be to say, but I feel like she's doing more now there. She wants me to go back again, because one of the major things you're having a hard time with is how she passes. Diane, yes, John, and she's making me feel like she doesn't want to tell me. She doesn't want to tell me how she passed. She's making me feel like you understand what I'm saying, and I don't have to describe to you exactly what happened although I'd rather hear it from her. But she's saying she won't. She does not want to go there. She's making me feel like she's in the back seat, and I feel like she could have been taking a nap. She could have had her headphones on. She could have been reading a book, whatever. There's all this hustle and bustle happening. She's getting whooshed off. I feel like I'm being whooshed, like I have to go to the next place. Diane, nodding her head, yes. John. Now, she did not pass on September 11th, but she's telling me to tell you 9-11. She's showing me 9-11. There's something about 9-11 connected to her in some way, or to your family, or to her. But it's like some of the families that I dealt with that are 9-11 related, they didn't have the ability to physically memorialize the person. You were able to do that in some respects, but there are things of hers that were not reclaimed, were missing, were things that you didn't get back. Diane. Yes. John. Now, I feel very, very clearly that you walk around acknowledging her. You know there's something else. Your belief, your faith, and your spirituality are very much intact. What you're not honoring, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot because I don't really know you, but what you're not honoring is your own grief. And one of the things that I have to tell you is that I believe the only way to get back to the love that you have, the unconditional love as a parent for this child, is to honor that grief. Because grief is on the other side of love. When you take away the physical person, the object you direct that love toward, you don't know where to put that love. You don't know where it goes. But she's still here. She's still connected here. You know, she's the one who arranged this. It's like she's taking credit for doing this. And she's making me feel that there is so much stuff that's not finished with her. Like the stuff she was working on. Something that wasn't finished. Diane. Yes, yes. John. Did she write? She must have been a writer. Because she had to do something that would be, they're making me feel that something important is coming out, like being published. There's a writing thing about her. I think they're making a movie on her, or on a smaller level. Maybe you're making a documentary on her? They're showing me Selena. You're not related to Selena, are you? Diane, no. John, then she's got to be like Selena. Diane, uh-huh. John, she wants me to acknowledge your mom, your biological mom. Your mom and she have overlapping similarities. There's a parallel between both. Whether it be the same name, similar dates, there's like a similarity that comes up there. And a few people pass in a short period of time as well. That you don't finish grieving one person and then this happens. That's my feeling. 
you're still dealing with the loss of one person. And now this compounds that feeling. Diane, yes. John, if you're going to do something writing-wise about her, you need to do it. You need to be the person to do it, not somebody else. With her own stuff, whatever she did job-wise. Was she trying to get more active in the control? Diane, yes. John, you just need to know that the stuff coming through with the older man we talked about in the beginning, the father figure, your mom, the great aunt, these are the people who are with her on the other side. She's not alone. She's got family and friends there. She's very clear in the fact that she was a social person in life, and she's equally social on the other side. Your spiritual beliefs, hold on to them. They're going to pull you and your family through this. Diane cries softly. Now you can read the full excerpts on the Tumblr page called Aliyah Always. I'll leave a link in the description. In her lifetime, Aliyah often spoke of her grandmother, who had passed away when she was younger. She wore her grandmother's unique jewelry and dedicated a portion of the artwork on her last album to her grandmother's memory. So it was comforting for Diane to know that she had been reunited with her grandmother. But on cross-examination, many of the general public had their own thoughts about Aliyah's mother, even down to rumors involving the whole R. Kelly situation, which we won't get into, but Aliyah's stage production manager, when he went on his infamous rant years ago, called out Aliyah's mother for allegedly having taken Continental Airlines back to the States on the morning of Aliyah's death. The day she died, when David Dash that morning, took Continental. That morning, her mom took Continental. Now, he didn't say she took Continental from the States back to the Bahamas after Aliyah died to identify the bodies, what he said was that she had left on the morning of Aliyah's death, implying that Diane was in the Bahamas and left out, which directly contradicts every other report from news outlets and friends that said Aliyah's mother was back in New York recovering from eye surgery and that Aliyah's father was with her. Aliyah's brother was in Australia on business. Now, usually her family traveled with her everywhere, but this Rock the Boat video shoot was so spur of the moment and the one time that her family wasn't with her, this happens, which is very strange to say the least. Aliyah's family would, however, be silent over the years and plan to tell Aliyah's story in a movie which set star actress Keisha Shantae to portray Aliyah, but things fell through for reasons unknown. And by 2012, the family was battling back and forth with Aliyah's greedy uncle, Barry Hankerson, over the release of Aliyah's unheard music being put out with Drake and Forty. But around this time, her father, Michael, was succumbed to kidney disease. He was of Jamaican heritage and was 61 years old at the time of his demise. Aliyah had donated to many cancer-related charities in her lifetime. One of them was the National Kidney Foundation. And the Aliyah Memorial Fund to this day helps raise money for that foundation. Her father would be buried in Ferncliff Mausoleum in New York, and his grave sits right above his daughter's grave. Man, rest in peace to them both. Little else is known about her father, but something I did want to touch on was Aliyah's fascination with returning to her home, which she felt was in Egypt. In that same Dietzite German magazine, Aliyah said, In my dream, I am in Egypt, the land of my dreams, the culture, the pyramids. That fascinates me. Yes, I'm sure I used to be an Egyptian in a past life. That's the only way I can explain my fascination. This country hit me at once under its spell, although I knew only from the pictures. When I was little, my mother showed me holiday photos of friends. I saw pyramids, gods, masks, people, strange ceremonies. I plunged into another world, and to explore this world is my biggest dream. One day I will travel to Egypt. I'll be there, where Cleopatra and the pharaohs lived. My books are my sanctuaries. I read every story about Egyptian kings and queens. Sometimes I look at even just the pictures. I dream that I am standing in front of these imposing structures or making a film in Egypt. I prefer to play Cleopatra. If there will one day be a remake of the film, I would love to apply for the lead role. The main thing, I could work in Egypt. With the Queen of the Damned, I play an Egyptian queen, Akasha. Aliyah then said that she wanted her man to be as strong as an Egyptian warrior. She said, if I find such, I'm gonna marry him. Like all little girls, I've always dreamed of a traditional wedding. I'm a hopeless romantic. I want a man and children, a happy family. And once I've established myself as an actress, I'm going to take a break and I want to go to college. What will I study? Of course, Egyptology. Unfortunately for baby girl, none of these things came to fruition. But throughout much of my anguish on discussing her tragic demise, I personally believe that she had fulfilled what she was called to do on this earth. 
that she had came to spread love to the fans across the world, touching the hearts of everyone she came into contact with. There are countless testimonials from celebrities to the average everyday people who all spoke of her loving, caring, and generous personality whenever they met her. I believe that some people are here to remind us of the beauty of life and that it is so short. So cherish every moment and every memory with those that you love. And Aliyah had left a lasting impact on the world that still resonates to this day. Here we go. Here we go. All right. This is, um, this is Aaliyah, you know, and, um, you know, it's my newest baby and I named her after Aaliyah, you know, because, um, that's how special she was to me, you know, so Aaliyah, hi, <laughs> you know, and know that you're named after an angel. Yep. Up next, we have the unfortunate demise of Aaliyah's friend and collaborator, rapper DMX, and after, we're going to get into Aliyah Part 5, which discusses the disrespect that Aliyah endured before and after her death. You can be kind to the world, but the world isn't always kind back. It's sad to see uh, Aliyah go because I always thought I was going to hook up with this chick. Aliyah. Whatever. <laughs> and I had a fantasy that one day I would have sex with her. I'm not kidding. You waited too long. I did. <laughs> And later, we will cover the demise of a pastor who died in the same manner, in the same area, and with the same number of people as Aliyah. All of this and more on Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like, and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And hit that notification bell, and I'll catch up with y'all in the next video.